sourced. It's, uh, I don't really have a sweet catchphrase yet for the channel. It's something I gotta work on. Just, I'm just not quite there yet. I want to be. Um, it'll happen. I have faith, faith in the process, all that good stuff. So, um, you know, it's. It's funny, I remember, you know, however long ago it was when Sam Cedar started the AM Quickie and he was like, I just gotta go for it, I can't, you know. I don't know if I should do the Michael voice or not, but at any rate, um, he was just kind of like talking about figuring it out as he goes along and um, I think that's very much so the way this, this is. Uh, folks maybe you know for anybody who's a, a regular viewer you will notice that I've kind of trying to spruce things up a little bit um with the channel and the way everything looks but uh yeah so it's been uh it's been a wacky week uh on a local end we didn't have the select board meeting yesterday because of technical concerns I guess which, okay, things happen, um, uh, but that's going to happen tonight, so I'll probably be back to, you know, uh, tomorrow's show is a little up in the air, so I'm sort of, you know, I've been, it, it's been a wacky week and just, you know, juggling a lot of things, so, uh, and, and what with the primary coming up on Tuesday next week, there's a bit of preparation there, and um, I am going to try and do some form of a live stream and have folks on to talk about stuff on Tuesday night because I think that could be fun for people um you know just try and have a drink or two and get our way through it um because <laughs> it's gonna be a mess uh unless you're sober in which case please stay dry um right so today a uh, cool thing that's going on. I was able to sit down with Tony LeBranche yesterday. Uh, he's from Amherst. And so I'm going to play that interview right now. And then when that's over, I'm going to come back and I'm just going to kind of go off on the, the democratic debate a little bit. Cause I think it's funny and I think there's stuff worth talking about. Cause, um, uh, spoiler alert, Andrew Valinsky killed it, uh, at least in my opinion. So I'll talk about that a bit, but, um, but first, we're going to get to this interview with Tony. So uh, be right back and enjoy. All right, folks, we are back. And right now I am joined with the one and only very excited Tony LeBranche is joining the stream today. Tony, how are you? I'm good. Good, good. I am I am glad to hear it. So um I am I'm very excited to have you on because your passions are passions of mine as well. And I think the the thing about them is that they're tools that could fundamentally really change the way democracy operates. And so I want to like, we'll, we'll get into your race too, obviously, because you are currently running and I think it's, it's always important to talk about that, but I want to, I want to do some, do some issues stuff. So, okay. Rank choice voting. What is it? How does it work? And why is it better? <laughs> okay. So, Ranked choice voting is when you rank your candidates of choice, making making it so that you can choose who you actually support instead of what we currently have, which is voting for the lesser of two evils. So ranked choice makes it so that you can put your favorite as your second choice or your first choice, and then you can always have a backup and a backup to that backup. So your opinion is always fully represented. So at the moment, if you vote Green Party for the presidential election, you're most likely not gonna win. 
or if you vote libertarian in the presidential election, you're also not most likely to win. But during ranked choice voting, you can vote your beliefs and you can then choose who you also support using the presidential race for an example. And this makes democracy more representative of the people. It makes it more equitable for people and it can lead to a legislature that is truly representative of the people and what we believe in. So I'm like, I'm very curious as to the, like, like, I guess what I should say is I'm very fascinated by the way it operates and the concept that it is more inherently fair in terms of representing somebody's opinion. So the idea being if when we say, you know, it would step down from say your first choice to your second choice, what cause it, what's the trigger within the electoral process that would say, make my second choice become what my vote goes for? Like how, how does that particular yep. part of the process work? So, it basically would be like a runoff election without having to have a second election. So in that case, you would have your normal election, November 3rd, you would rank your vote and whoever comes in last place will be eliminated because they have the least amount of support yet their supporters still want a leader to represent them. So in that case, I'll use the last presidential election. For example, if you voted for Jill Stein, you, probably would prefer Hillary Clinton over the current incumbent of the White House. Mm -hmm. So you would be able to represent what you truly believe in. And this stands for libertarians, for people who believe in the Constitution Party. It would make it so that we aren't having two parties have a stranglehold over our democracy. And it would make it so that people who are of different third parties actually have a chance of winning instead of what a lot of people say would be you can't vote third party because it's wasting your vote or you're splitting the vote or you're leading to the person that you actually truly dislike uh, winning. Sure. Okay. So why, like, I mean, and I guess maybe this is kind of baked into what you just said, but I want to drill down further. Why is it so difficult to gain traction on support for the issue? Um, you know, like with folks that already have office, right? So I'm there's there's the part of me that's very, very interested in in why this is such a tough sell, you know, like what's what's it that's making this what's so difficult? It? Yeah. Yeah. So I will say there's probably two major components to it. Uh, the first would be voter apathy. Uh, we focus more on the issues that affect us and ranked choice voting, not necessarily, it's not something tangible. It's not healthcare. It's not a booming economy. It's not um, any other of the mo major issues that we hear about every day in politics. Um, and the second one would be those in power. Why don't they, they think about this issue? And it's not that they don't think about this issue. It's because the two parties are so entrenched and they really have to ask themselves, do we want to give third parties a chance when that means I could get kicked out of office? Because at the moment, both parties enjoy just being the only parties in power and none of them will willingly give away that power to a third party. So the issue at hand really is people who want to keep their positions and don't want to give it away or make it easier for other parties to have a fighting chance at an election. Sure. So it's in a lot of ways, it's about hanging on to power. Really. It's just a continued, it's a continuation of the power grab essentially. Yep. So how, how do you think we, discuss this issue and change the frame of it in a way that would create an urgency amongst voters to 
advocate for this more frequently i you know, i guess yeah. for me it's like how do we get people to support yeah yeah how do we feels get like, this movement going right and it feels because to me it often feels like most of the conversation that i hear surrounding it exists very much so inside the bubble and i'm wondering what the strategy or tactic that like, not broadly speaking but like for you if you're out you know and you run into some like oh yeah i don't really pay attention to politics that much kind of person at a barbecue or whatever what's the way that you sell that person on rank choice i i sell them by saying that changing the way we elect our leaders and changing our electoral system to one that is more fair and equitable will lead to a more stable and a more um sustainable government because at the moment we have the two parties which have been polarizing more and more every single year mm -hmm. and that means every four years the democrats come in charge they put forward their platform they start working towards what they want and then four years later all that progress is gone and the republicans then do what they want for the next four years or how long they stay in power while a ranked choice system would make it so that you have to cooperate with at least another party. So whether that would be the Republicans cooperating with the Libertarians or Democrats cooperating with them or any other third party that might come to power, mm -hmm. it means that there is more continuity every four years. It's not a pendulum that swings. Uh, right. So I would say that it makes it so that progress is sustained for example, such as in Germany, they have a um, proportional representation system. And because of that, no party ever reaches a majority of 51%. Okay. So they always have to talk to a third party. Sure. They always have to cooperate and compromise. And that is why they are able to have the social programs they have. That's why they are able to pro progress like they have. Mm -hmm. um, while in the US, it's always like, we have to rebuild every four years and start from scratch. Right. So. Right. Well, and it's, yeah, I mean, I guess that's not entirely out of line with the way that we do stuff anyways. Uh, you know, temporary infrastructure designed to crumble after a certain amount of time that's to be replaced because ostensibly that creates more jobs, even though I, we could get into that um <laughs> but it's i think the thing about it is that i'm very intrigued by the discussion surrounding reforming democratic processes themselves like people say they you know it's like oh i really love democracy democracy it's like okay what kind of democracy are you talking about you know that's because um there's a lot of ways that that can take form. And I think the discussions that you're approaching by bringing this up with folks, something, you know, like by paying attention to rank choice um, or questioning other functions of the government, which I'll, I'll get into with the next question. But um, it seems like by doing that, we're trying to elevate the general discussion around how things function how they operate so that we can actually have a like not a downgraded democracy like we, we like we lost our democratic like full democracy status yeah um which is pretty tragic and you know campaign finance reform is a huge component of it i feel like too it's because you know, we're the only country that is a democracy that allows corporations to be people right Right, which in a lot of ways doesn't make sense. Um, you know, if you want to get real, like, you know, if if you want to get real, like, Marxist theory about it, it's um, it replace like like the idea of a company being treated like a person is. It, it creates an equivalence that no no individual worker or wake, worker or nor, no individual person has the ability to compete with a corporation, right? Like yeah. somebody can have independent wealth sitting at the top of it, but that one person isn't necessarily like they're serving a much bigger system. Yeah. Um, 
So it's like along with that, right? It's like, okay, we could do campaign finance reform, but we'd still be stuck with the choosing the lesser of two evils thing. And your point is essentially that rank choice solves that problem, if if I'm not mistaken. It's it's a stepping stone in other reforms that I would advocate for at one point. So Sure, okay, cool. There's like I said, the German model of mixed member proportional. You can get into like the whole electoral theory of it all, but ranked choice voting is a good place to start. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, so in that vein, right, if we're talking about electoral reform, um, you had brought something up that I thought is uh, like I've thought about this before. I've heard other people bring it up. I think it's an interesting discussion topic. Um, and that's uh, the idea of abolishing the Senate, um, yes. which like, you know, I – is it, we're just we're just going for gold here. Um, so, like, first off, why? And second, you know, like, it, like I I generally agree with it, but I wanna I I wanna sort of put it to you to explain the position because I think you'll probably have a good I think you'll probably have a good take on it. Um, but also, and then t- sort of supplementary to that is reform or abolish. Yeah. So I'll start by saying the U.S. Senate is okay for now, but the New (laughs) Hampshire Senate. um, So we have a Senate at the federal level because it was a compromise. You have the House of Representatives that represents the people. It's called the People's House and the Senate, which represents the states. And this was a compromise between the big states and the little states. And this makes sense under a federal government. But we have a Senate here in New Hampshire, but we aren't a big state. We don't have, we're not a federal, federalized state. Um, there's not, yes, there are differences in our state, but they're not that big that we would require a Senate that represents them. And the thing about New Hampshire's Senate is that at least at the federal level, it represents the states, a smaller form of government below it. But here in New Hampshire, the Senate is simply just bigger districts that represent people, but we already have the New Hampshire state house that represents the people. And the issue with the New Hampshire Senate is that it's been gerrymandered. It's, it's been manipulated in a way to draw the maps to the politicians favors. And so the idea of abolish or reform reform would be, well, a way to make it not gerrymandered and make it a way that makes sense instead of representing the people in the House and in the Senate would be two per county in New Hampshire. So it would rec- represent the smaller counties more, and it would also make it so that you can't gerrymander maps of counties because the counties are already set. And then there's the idea of abolition because there is no raison d'etre for the Senate in New Hampshire. There, There is no big differences in our state population. The issues are pretty much the same on, compared to the federal level where the Senate has to represent states like Arizona and New Hampshire and California. Um, and we already represent the people in the state house. There are already 400 state representatives. There's three in Amherst alone. Um, so Another reason to abolish it would be the Senate is where most legislation goes to die, especially progressive legislation. Um, If we really want change, we can't keep this body, which has been corrupted and really serves no purpose besides slowing down legislation that we have already discussed. Um, And I know that's a radical position, but in all sense, the Senate has to either represent smaller form of government or there really is no other reason for an upper house. Well, but I mean, what's the, I mean, mean, you say radical, but I mean, the hell is radical even, you know what I mean? Like in all seriousness, look, I don't like the guy, like, but (laughs) Jefferson made a good point about, you know, dissent being the highest form of patriotism. And I think, this falls within that category, right? That, you know, 
what the hell are we doing if we're not inspecting the system that we're using, right? Like, if you have a tool, do you, like, like you, if you, okay, maybe not a tool. I'll use, I'll, I mean, a, a tool works, but I'll use your car, right? Do mm-hmm. you just not take your car to the shop? And get like, do you, do we like do folks just get cars and just drive it and think like, oh geez, I never t- need to like replace the tires or like maybe I should check to see if I have enough oil. Like mm-hmm. times change. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's okay to look at your system and not just constantly be like, we have to protect this at all costs. And what are we gonna do? Ah, like I don't care, man. And like, <laughs> there are other states that have done this. Nebraska. Well, they did the other way around. They abolished their um, the House of Representatives, but kept their Senate because it was a smaller body. Okay. Um, but Nebraska is a unicameral legislature, and it represents the people um, directly. So there are examples of other states that have reformed their system to make it either A, more logical, or for funding purposes. So um, I do think that it is a tangible thing that we can do here in New Hampshire. I mean, what do you, what's your take on, okay, so let's, let's take the reform side for a second, right? Like what's, where are you at on how you'd like to see that go? I mean, do you, are, would you co-sign the idea of say reallocating Senate seats to counties? Personally, I am more of an abolitionist, but I do believe that reform is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, because at the moment, um, I remember looking at the maps of the Senate districts now compared to 10 years ago, and you can tell that there's been a lot of manipulation. There's been Senate seats that have just completely moved regions. And I don't think that, well, A, it's not okay for the politician to choose the voter. And two, I think that counties are often like the last thing we think about, like, we all know federal, we all know state, and we all know local, but we always seem to forget that there's an in-between between county or between local and state. There's the county. Mm-hmm. So I think that the county is actually a good place to make that system work because it will represent a smaller form of government, but also um, be more representative for them. Well, and actually, this kind of gets into this. This gets into an interesting area for me because I feel like this is something I actually don't know. I don't know nearly enough about. Is what what does? I mean, and I mean, maybe there's more to look into here for sure too. But what exactly does county government even handle? I mean, I know that we deal with county prosecutors, um, but what? So that's sort of like your your like your district attorney kind of equivalent, I guess. So th- so it would be the county handles um, senior living, so public senior living. It handles corrections and the court system. Um, so it's more of the administrative stuff that the county does okay. um, on a county level, um, because not every town needs a courthouse or a superior court. Sure. Um, Julie's going to be proud of me because she's running for county commissioner in my district. Um, so awesome. Well, I mean, because I, I ju- that's good because I it, to have that kind of setup. I'm glad that we've got that laid out because it's so. It is kind of important to understand that on the county level, like I mean, in terms of the broader defund the police conversation, county level is a great place to focus on that type of. Yes that that attention and that energy so um and actually that might I, I mean to that end i wonder if that type of reformation would do good for better representing the issue of defunding or just like just generally fund allocation that's actually the reason that my friend julie is running for county commissioners because she realized how overlooked the county level is and how Usually it's a Republican that runs for the county commissioner and he usually goes there unopposed or yep. with a light opposition. So she took it upon herself to run for the, the county level and she says she wants to reform the mm-hmm. prison system and also wants to invest in health care for our seniors. So I think the county level is a good place to focus a lot of the issues, frankly, on. Yeah, yeah. Well, so and I mean, I guess that kind of gets 
that gets back into like, oh, and maybe it does make sense to reassess the idea of what we tie Senate seats to. Like, if we're going to have a Senate, maybe we should at least, you know, and I guess there is a there is question of sort of like, all right, what part of like, what's the mechanical way that you go about making that change, right? Like, is that a, is that a bill that gets passed? Do we have to do some sort of constitutional amendment? Like, how does I that work? I believe it would have to be a constitutional amendment, okay. which I had this conversation with Senator Carson. She is my college professor, and she's a Republican representing the Londonderry area. Nice. <laughs> and she strongly disagrees with the idea of abolishing the Senate. Um, obviously, as a senator, she doesn't want to lose her job. Right. But um, I think that if the people, if we make this an issue that people are aware of, and how it makes more sense to make it closer to the people at a county level instead of having Senate districts that can go from the south of New Hampshire to central New Hampshire. Also, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, no worries. I think that people would be more invested in a Senate that is closer to them. Yeah, I agree completely. I, I, I'm, I'm with you 100 on it, man. Like, I... Yeah, I, <laughs> just no complaints from me. But that's a good example, though, right? Like, of when you get into the 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 weeds of it all right like there's we, we i think that the thing to remember is this is a small state like new hampshire is a very small state and we are very subject to small rural america dynamics and that includes the same kind of like um you know like it's i think maybe and i don't i'm not i'm not out here to suggesting anybody is corrupt but the point <laughs> my point is that um it is very easy to encounter like corruption by default in smaller local governments because it's much easier to have that like oh hey this is my buddy phil and i'm gonna try and help him get a job kind of thing and it's like not overt but there's a certain amount of like career preservation or career advancement that's occurring that I think we all kind of ha like it's, it's only more recently that I think, especially in younger generations, people are like, wait a minute, that's a continuation of a power dynamic. That's really unhealthy. Um, as you know, as opposed to just being like, Oh, this is a function of how politics in the state work. Right. Where it's like, well, Oh, well I'm against that because I lose my job. It's like, well, yeah, of course you're against it. Cause you lose your job. But the whole point yeah. is not like preserving your job. The point is helping the people be governed the yeah. best. <laughs> right. Like, or I, save I, money on this project that we no longer need or something to that ex extent. Yeah. Well, and, and to me, it's like, it's even a more fundamental point of like, you want government to represent people accurately and equitably and fairly. And if that's the case, then it's worth looking at an institution who's the people that would preserve it are the people who are saying, no, I don't want to get rid of it because then I won't have a job anymore. It's like it's a very like, you know, the system is trying to like observe itself and it's very, yes. you know, uh, cumbersome. So, um, I mean, I guess my big takeaway from talking about rank choice or, you know, questioning the value of the Senate when I think back on other previous conversations I've had on this channel, I, you know, there's a long talk that I did with Ivy Van that I've brought up a number of times where we talk about like the issue with term limits and the fact that time sh spaces are actually too small for folks. A lot of times, like you don't, you don't have enough, you're, you're getting ready for an election before you even had a chance to legislate. So you don't know, you yep. don't get a chance to actually show that you know what you're doing. You know what I mean? So there's an argument for like reducing the seat count and increasing the term length, but then imposing term limits on a extended term length. So my thing that I hear is it's like, okay, the big takeaway is that we need to normalize discussing and thinking critically about how we actually go about legislating in New Hampshire and not just like not just the policy itself but the way in which we are trying to actually enact the policy. Would you say that's like a reasonable like 
target yeah, so, for folks to hit like or shoot for like question the system we currently have and how we can actually make it better for everybody or yeah. more equitable for all parties involved yeah and it's like and hey if you're it's it's like if you know any of your fight the system friends and they like to say fight the system get them to say this stuff instead because it's more productive that would be like 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 don't just say fight the system tell us how we're gonna fight the system by replacing it with something better so um that's that's usually my like thought that i have on that i feel free to disagree with it but um at any rate i do want to ask you about your primary and how just like how is that going what's it like doing this in the time of coronavirus what it's like what is it like being a younger person running in in hillsborough and amherst and this is you know it's just it's this is an interesting part of the state to be doing that in so i just love to hear your like thoughts feelings experiences on it it's definitely a very weird time to be holding an election and running for office um I ran for school board in March, and one of the things I learned is people like to get to know you face to face, but I can't do that anymore. I can't have events. I can't meet people off the street. Um, so it's definitely harder to have that one on one human connection with somebody because it's definitely not the same giving them a phone call as it would be meeting them in person. Um, and not everybody's as. Um, as good with zoom as uh people who have had to do online school like i have um but i've been using social media i've been doing a few phone banks um but it's definitely not the optimal time to be campaigning yeah no i definitely i definitely feel that how much how much do you feel like the, the whole digital side of things is is affecting that process like do you do you notice there being positive engagement in digital spaces or are you finding that like i mean i know for for our own part here and i'm i'm over in peterborough and it's like a political mess in this town right now there's people stealing signs and yeah it's just it's a disaster so it's like i'm you know i know that facebook can be a very treacherous place uh for you know local political discourse and so i mean have you found that like like it's easy to get into fights there but i guess i'm wondering like have you had any success stories come out of of campaigning yeah. through social media like any any shining examples that uh, could encourage folks no <laughs> All right. Um, that's that's like, a fairly really legit answer. <laughs> like, it's been very hard, I guess, to like actually talk to voters in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like a lot of people have pent up anger. Like, I had a few negative uh, situations happen over Facebook, but I feel like it's easier to talk to my fellow candidates, I guess, through an online format. Yeah. Especially when we, you know. I can talk to a state representative from Concord or at the seacoast, but not have to, you know, drive all the way there. Right. But when it comes to voter outreach, it's been uh, unusually quiet, I would say. I feel like a lot of people are also, they're already dealing with the pandemic. It's already a rough time in life that a lot of people have sort of already disengaged. Like they're either supporting donald trump or they're on the anti donald trump and there's no real like there it feels more like they're gonna vote down the ballot if even they're gonna fill their whole ballot out sure so it's like it's i mean i definitely get the sense that this is a tough time to be doing primary stuff period because of the like the broad like anti-trump anybody but trump kind of like like damn it i'm saying like too much again um <laughs> <laughs> this anybody but trump movement stuff is really really deflating the tires in my opinion like <laughs> we are screwed um in a it's like i understand that you do not like him but would you like to get to know me as a candidate who wants to represent you yeah yeah it's you know <laughs> It's really frustrating to me because I feel 
as though so many people are just checking out of political discussion and it, it's making it very difficult for not only the left to get like some real traction in on on issues that are so fundamental to resolving the issues that we're having like rank choice or like you know um abolishing the senate or like campaign finance reform things like this that are kind of can sound wonky to somebody who's just trying to go work you know at the you know work packing boxes at the local factory and send stuff out and they're like i don't care like what are you talking about with all this stuff um mm -hmm. and it can be hard for the left to be getting a foothold in that right now like foothold in that right now while we're so challenged by this like over expansion for lack of a better term of the democratic tent there's like i definitely feel this sense of frustration amongst the left as the you know after the dnc with the tent broadening and everybody being really shocked that we're all of a sudden giving so much airtime to like john Kasich. you know what i mean it's like it's ridiculous more than aoc <laughs> yeah and to to think that that's uh, for anybody that, that wants to believe that's not affecting down ballot progressive primary races it's it absolutely is people are checking out and that's really not good so i'm mean, that's my another opinion. thing that i believe we should talk about when it comes to ranked choice voting is that it would lead to less big tent parties and it would lead to like you could have your very specific political views expressed in a party instead of having to say i'm a democrat because i agree with them 51 percent of the time compared to 49 percent with republicans or anything like that you would be able to there like if we had the perfect legislation legislature you would be able to have all these variety of views expressed instead of being i'm I'm either black or I'm white or like I'm left, I'm right. I'm like polarized. Yeah. Yeah. You're taking away that dichotomy nature of it and giving it a more of a multiple choice or multiple possible outcome yeah. scenario. Yeah. It's adding shades of gray or different chances. Yeah. I think that's, you know, and, and honestly it's like, it's, it's not just that big tent thing. I mean, I think something that we, something about new hampshire and the way that our legislature is in its just absurd size results in us having many of the same problems that the country as a whole encounters so we're like like 150 years older and like a tenth the size but realistically it's you know it's kind of the it, it, it is a microcosm in a way. And if we want to deal with the frustrations that I would say a lot of progressives have with the Democratic Party, for example, right, in this state, the weird big tent nature of the Democrats in New Hampshire, this could, again, help to alleviate that particular problem. So I don't know how many like disengaged voters that I run into that are just like, man, I don't care. Like, I just don't care about it because they're all the same. And they're all, and I just I'd love it if we could get away from that kind of um, defaulting, I guess. You know, it's like in a, in a you know, in a general election, obviously, I would certainly advocate for down ballot voting for the most part but i also you know that's the general and i would say if you're not doing your research on the candidates you should probably do that um yeah that's you know we gotta we gotta put that in so is your now do you do you find your race to be competitive right now is it like are you are you shaking in your boots or how are you feeling so my primary at the moment it is a three seat district mm -hmm. um, with four people running, but um, the fourth candidate hasn't done much publicity. Okay. Um, by that, I mean, 
we haven't heard from her until about three days ago. Okay. Uh, we okay. called her the ghost candidate for a long time. That's that's. But it turns out that she is living and breathing and not a ghost. So, well, good. Um, but I do think that that primary is pretty uncompetitive at the moment. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and we're already looking towards the general election and how we will try to make Amherst completely blue for the first time ever. Yeah, I like that. I like I like hearing that you're you're going for it, dude. That's We came 14 votes last time from having the first completely blue uh state delegation there. So Yes. All right. So, um last question then I got a jet um you know, for anybody who's watching this, this is recorded. So I actually have a select board meeting that's about to happen. We had a selectman resign in my town, so that's a bit a bit controversial. Yeah. So um but at any rate, I do want to ask this last question because I think it's it matters and it's always it's something that I think needs to get touched on. So I if assuming you're comfortable going here, um what's it like being a member of the LGBTQ community running right now what's that climate like in this state it's something that i always want to check in with people on because folks for some reason folks love to think that we just got past the issues with people and like we yeah, never it did. Went compl- we went from homophobia and homophobia died over my night like yeah yeah like i always all of a get sudden that. chris pappas gets elected and it's like nothing and you know and ray buckley is chair of the dems and we're it's like we forget so we're I good just, I yeah, we're all set <laughs> yeah so how's what's your personal experience with that been like so i've been i was like basically running in the closet last election where it's like i made it a non-issue i never talked about it I actually ended up having to give a speech at the Amherst Republicans meeting because it was a local nonpartisan election. Um, And then while I was there, a leader there started giving a speech about why we should not allow gay marriage and why we should not like allow this in the state of New Hampshire and how we have to bring moral values back to New Hampshire and how LGBT uh, people are not compatible with that. And um, this election, I've actually had my first experiences with like actual homophobia and harassment issues um, because of that. Even though I think I have done a pretty good job about making it a not a non-issue, um, but you know, Trump conservatives will find a way to find that out and to try to make it an issue, but it should not be an issue. Are you finding that you're getting support from from other blue constituents and people in your area? Like, are are people coming out to like to have your back on it, or is it like how's how's the solidarity been? Actually, the first person I called after that incident was my current state rep, who is running for re-election, and she is always the most supportive person. She's like a mentor to me, mm-hmm. and she's like, uh because I, I, it was an emotional time and she was saying like, oh, we've all been there. There's always been that like that first time where you get harassed for running for office because they try to scare you out of it. But in the end, we're all in this together and it's just one constituent or a few constituents and the vast majority of people will, will see them for what they are and what I am for compared to them. Right. And what would you... I mean, I, obviously, it's always the work of people who are not subject to um, to hatred or bigotry or or whatever, right? It's it's always the onus is on the people that don't know to educate themselves, right? But I always want to take that time to sort of get the opinion of people who are on the receiving side of that and say, okay, like what you know what are your experiences what's your check-in to let folks know like hey here's here's the best way at this point in time that to that that we could people who are running for office 
that are LGBTQ, what's the best way for folks to show solidarity like that beyond just, you know, like being there when like being like, yeah, you can call me if something, if someone's a huge asshole to you, you know, like it's okay to hit me up and we'll like, we'll just talk it through. And maybe that's all there is to it, but how, like what, what, what kind of ways can folks meaningfully show that solidarity? Um, this is going to be more speaking to the general election, but mm -hmm. I do think the other side has to do its own, uh, its own enforcement of telling supporters that crossing certain lines is not okay. And I know in some places in New Hampshire where we do really have a big divide, that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think part of it is standing shoulder to shoulder. Of course, you can't do that during COVID-19, but yeah. um solidarity and showing support for one another and showing that um hate doesn't stop me but it makes me stronger so yeah well and it's you know i always just think like maybe you know to anybody who is who considers themselves an ally you know like my oh like two cents is always like just make sure that you have the stones to stand up for it when the time comes you know what i mean like if you see it happening like actually yep. have the courage to engage in it and try and shut it down you know that's like i think that's probably one of the biggest obstacles for a lot of people is like it's one thing to say yeah i don't i'm against this right and it's another thing to have some you know some redneck jerk ass motherfucker screaming homophobic shit and like you know like out in the middle of the mr mike's parking lot or what have you and you're like okay man like like i just want to ignore this guy and it's like yeah but if he's really genuinely threatening somebody or you know like no when it's no one it's okay to step in you know like it's yeah. you know, the left gets too timid sometimes you know yeah i always hear like i'm an ally and then like weeks later when something does happen it's always they're the silent ones when you turn to them but i feel like part of it is being a vocal ally not just say i'm sitting on sitting on the sidelines type of ally because right um supporting me and actually defending me in my times of needs are very different things yeah exactly i i i am i am with you absolutely tony <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me today. This is a really, really solid conversation. Um, I really, really quite enjoyed it. As I, as have I. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, okay. Good luck. Good luck on Tuesday. And I, I, I look forward to talking to you again soon, man. Have a good one. Okay. Take care. See ya. All right, folks, back. Um, awesome, awesome interview with Tony. I really I had a good time with that. And I, everybody, you know, follow him on Twitter at Tony LeBranche. He's, uh, dude's got some good ideas. So, um, okay, here is the part of the show where I do some rambling because i i feel like i haven't done any never done a whole lot of this the, the the solo stuff for a bit so okay what like all right <laughs> the democratic debate the uh just this this gubernatorial debate um really Fun times. I personally strongly believe in the value of these debates, mainly because I think this is one of the few opportunities that folks get a chance to really see how candidates are going to stack up 
um, and how they're going to go about doing something, how they deal with things when they're on their feet, um, when they're on it, basically on blast um, by a news station. Uh, you know, they, they have all eyes on them. And I think this is exactly the type of situation that shows us where folks are at in terms of their ability to lead or command a situation or take control of a narrative. It just, it, it's my personally, like, I, it's my personal belief that a debate is just a really key component. I know it doesn't always, it, doesn't always result in a actual change it doesn't it might not always move the needle it kind of depends on who it is or what it is or where it is or what the context is but i think there's a lot of importance in understanding that wmur where this debate is hosted is the only the only private news station in the state like this they're the only you know aside from say a public access station um the they're that's it wmur really has the whole thing kind of monopolized and um there is a piece on the patreon if uh for folks if you want to get in there and check it out uh, about um why local news is important uh talks a bit about kind of the the history of WMUR and and where they come from and who William Randolph Hearst was. Um, so there's there's context there, but you know I think it's important to understand that because even within this debate, there was a whole lot of incredibly conservative framing of certain questions um, when it came to asking about asking both candidates, frankly, about whether or not they had eaten out at a restaurant, whether they, um, you know, why they felt it was okay to attend BLM rallies, but it's, you know, it's not okay for racetracks to open up. It's like, they're really... It can be, it's it's a totally separate discussion to discuss the nature of why the questions that they ask are like lean conservative. And I think that's time, that's, that's content for a different episode, but I, because I could burn probably an hour talking about this and frankly, I'm hungry and it's almost lunchtime for me. So I do want to just kind of like hop into some of the actual content here because i think this is like mainly uh, mainly what i'm going to focus on are two parts of the debate because i think that generally speaking you find that there's there's a a lot of time where they're agreeing with each other um and what i want to hone in on is some specific differences and mainly it comes down to approach um and it comes down to responsibility. And I mean, I said at the top of this show that I think Andrew absolutely killed it. And I think I, what I'm going to do is we're, we're going to take out some clips and we're going to talk about exactly why that's the case. Um, so first up, I have um, <laughs> this one's funny because it's. It's from a lightning round, and it gets into a whole topic of discussion that I don't think they meant to get into, and the whole lightning round gets gets derailed, which is a riot. So this I'm gonna I'm gonna hit play on this, and we'll 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 watch this, and I'll just sort of talk about it afterwards. So here we go. Oh.
Oh, well, folks, sorry. I just realized that I had an audio issue there that whole time. So here's what we're going to do. I will bounce this back and we are going to we're going to redo this. Um, sorry about that technical issue and sorry about all that dead space. Um, yeah, so let's restart this so that we can <laughs> so we can get into this. Here we go. Or less. Okay, so the first one regarding judicial nominees, should working on or for a political campaign disqualify a lawyer from serving on the bench here in New Hampshire? Councillor Valinsky first, please. Should not disqualify the lawyer, but it's appropriate to ask what the platforms were. That's the problem with Gordon McDonald's nomination. He twice worked for political parties that denied the right to reproductive freedom and that's disqualifying. Senator. Well, Andrew lifts up his blocking of Gordon McDonald as the alleged third anti-choice justice on the New Hampshire Supreme Court, five-member court. Well, if that's the case, I guess the question for Andrew is, why did he vote for the first two? I I'm happy to answer that if I'm permitted. Please, they, please. They didn't they didn't have documented records of antagonism towards reproductive rights. And if you were so concerned about the first two, why didn't you say something d during either of their nomination processes? Senator, uh, respond to that, please, and then we'll move on. Well, uh, because um, I I'm not on the executive council, and I think the questions need to come from Andrew <laughs> on the executive council, and he voted. Okay, so like. Like, this is really funny because Dan's just trying to turn this around, but he's, Andrew's actually answered the question. He's, he's fundamentally answered the question right here that they didn't have, they didn't have birth control rights issues and he can't be discriminatory. So I just, we're, I'm going to let this go again because this is really like, this is just priceless folks. But for the first two, uh, so I don't think we've heard an explanation about why he voted for them. I thought they were qualified, and I don't disqualify candidates just because they're Republicans. I look at their documented record, and there was no documented record of antagonism towards reproductive rights, as there was with Gordon McDonald. And if you think I missed something, you had the responsibility to point it out in time rather than to take shots during a debate. Senator. <laughs> so that the face there. Blinsky. <laughs> Malinsky's <laughs> face is killing me right now. Okay, so <laughs> like, this is the thing, man. Is that Dan's really just trying to like harp on Andrew for you know why did you you let these conservative judges in? And this is the problem because okay. It, the reason I think debates are important, right, is because it gives us an opportunity to understand the political mindset of candidates. Now, what I would say, I think it's it's fairly safe to make this assertion about it, right, that Andrew is very focused on policy and Dan is very focused on party if you like throughout the debate if you listen to the way Dan approaches things he approaches things in a very like system party oriented from within the structure going to deal with this process oriented stuff Volinsky repeatedly just brings up policy points and things that need to be approached or dealt with or um or or challenged right now that might have something to do with literally the difference between being a senator and being an executive counselor one is definitely more about like creation and generation and sort of the process but if we as opposed to the executive council position which is a bit more critical but if we step back for a second and we think about the interview that was just played with tony the reality is, is that the Senate is just a bunch of people proofreading legislation. You know what I mean? Like, 
there's there's a certain amount of proposal, but frankly, this is a lot of people just sitting there getting to say yay or nay on stuff. And Valinsky's point is that in the entire nomination process, Feltis could have easily weighed in. So while Dan is attacking Andrew for allowing these conservative people to join the court, which, you know what? Like, partisanship is not... A, is not in of itself a simple reason to deny someone's appointment. And if we think about this, it's actually, the, Valinsky basically did that exact thing when, it, like, more or less, when it came to a, a more recent education post that triggered an entire um, backlash response within the context of BLM which was reasonable and Andrew owned up to it. But the point is that the second you do that, right, you lose your progressive bona fides because you're, you're immediately just, you're, you're doing the same politicization that's pissing everybody off. So Dan's just perpetuating that within this context. There's no, there's no like, self-reflection upon it right and Andrew is doing exactly the right thing by just taking it and turning it right around and saying like yeah okay look like I can't do that these people didn't have any record of being against abortion rights or you know reproductive rights broadly speaking um conservative though they may have been I wasn't able to make that assertion based off of their their history um so that's it. It, it. There's there's the fact of the matter. And his point is great. That if Dan really objected to this, he could have done it during the process. And where is he at? So Andrew puts that puts that back on Dan. And I think what's so funny is that he doesn't actually have an answer for it right here. He just kind of slips right through it. We'll keep going. Better please respond. Well, you know, look, I, I think it's clear. Uh, Andrew has campaigned on his blocking of Gordon McDonald as the alleged third anti-choice justice of a five-member court. And the first two, he voted for. So he's basing much of his campaign on this. So I, I don't think he's answered the question about why he voted for the first two. I, the first. So, I mean, like he did, though. And this is this is why I say watch the debates, because from a purely debate tactic right now, Feltis looks real bad. Like, that was a really, really foolish way to respond to that. Because he just doubled down on a take that he had earlier that got crushed. So, like, uh, and, and maybe that's just, maybe he's not great at debating, but frankly, I don't want that. Right. As a voter, I don't want somebody who can't think on their feet enough to know that you shouldn't repeat that point after you've been slammed on it. Like repeating a falsehood doesn't suddenly make it true. OK, Valinsky answered that question outright. And Dan's just not he, he he's he's fundamentally not accepting it. And that's I think that might be something that I want folks on the left to really really like think about that okay think about that good and 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 and, and hard because um <sighs> this is what they're going to do right this is the way this is going to happen is that we have to deal with the center at, Claiming progressive bona fides, which they state at the very opening of this. Now, I'm not saying Dan's not progressive at moments. He certainly is. He has his he has his his spots about it. But in comparison to Valinsky, it's just not really a contest at this moment in time. I just don't I don't see that um, being the case. And they're going to try and take that progressive mantle, and then they're going to make arguments like this. And part of the reason I'm doing this is because I want to have another voice out here that points out just how, fun, like, just how hard Andrew wrecked Dan on this. Folks need to understand just how bad that was. Like, 
it's really really bad so uh, I'll, I'll i'll roll on a little bit more i think i lost my place a little bit so we might end up rewatching some of this um but i just want to i just want to kind of double back on it just watch it a little bit more because this is just this is really silly of Gordon McDonald as the alleged third anti-choice justice of a five-member court. And the first two, he voted for. So he's basing much of his campaign on this. So I don't think he's answered the question about why he voted for the first two. I, the first two were not anti-choice. Okay. Actually, the first one was a woman who supports reproductive rights. And I have not said Gordon was the third. Okay, okay. I said he uh, was the chief justice. Gentlemen, thank you. We're going to move on now to the next question in our lightning round. Senator Feltus, let's direct this one to you first. So, I mean, look, it's just, and, and that ends, right? That just ends right there. Andrew gets the last word. And, I mean, look at Dan's face. Look at his, like, that's, that was that was a, a a an attack that really just fell flat like that was a super super flat fall and it didn't it it honestly like it was an attack on on andrew and the only thing that it really did was make dan look like he doesn't know how to how to handle himself in a debate that he's and and what I think is so funny is that he constantly talks about how you know oh well our campaign isn't trying to tear people down I mean like don't I you're in a debate dude and you're literally doing that exact thing like I'm sorry a, a race is about beating your opponent it's what it is like you're gonna have to make attacks um in the process of proving that you're better on an issue than somebody else and what dan does throughout this entire debate is repeatedly attack andrew and then say well we're not about trying to tear people down but what is he trying to do here he's trying to tear down andrew's record as a prosecutor it's constantly trying to make this comparison. So it's kind of like it's it's again a little bit more of this speaking out of both sides of the mouth thing, which is a super hallmark of New Hampshire centrists, not New Hampshire progressives. Or it is if you misidentify what progressive means in this context. And I think we have a fraught experience with that word in this state i think it's a challenge for us sometimes i think people don't necessarily have a very rigid idea of what progressive means so everybody's in a different place on it i think it's a challenging word sometimes i think it's a little nebulous i am fine with nebulousness i think that's okay um but i think it means that we need to be more careful about how we delineate what um what that spectrum itself looks like so um right okay uh i want to move on to the um <laughs> i want to move on to the tax portion of this because i think this is this is the other part that i really like i enjoyed quite a bit again i gotta stop saying like so much this is the worst folks i am so sorry one of these days i'll get better i promise one of these days um, until then, let's check out this clip. Uh, you have said, of course, that you do not support a broad-based income or sales tax. Uh, Councilor Valinsky, you've, of course, not made that pledge prominently, and you said you might be open to such a tax, either one or both, or we're not sure. So let's direct this question <laughs> to you. What specifically, now that's a week before the primary, will you propose to relieve the property tax burden on those who need it the most? So the premise of your question is that we can live with the property tax. We can't. It's got a crushing burden. It's immoral. It forces seniors to ration their medication so that they can pay their taxes to stay in their homes. It keeps us from building affordable housing that young people and working people need. It, help, it hurts us in developing small businesses that also create jobs because in broad swaths of our state, we cannot open businesses because of the tax burden. The property tax is New Hampshire's 
broadest based tax. It's unfair and it's immoral. So I would say this. About a week ago, experts before the School Funding Commission said two things. One, we spend about the right amount of money, $3.2 billion, and two, we can solve the school funding problem constitutionally without an income or sales tax relying on a fair statewide property tax. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna I am gonna jump in here for a moment because I wanna make I wanna kinda make a distinction on this before we jump in, right? So Valinsky is actually saying two different things right here. And I think it it it, it goes a little over Dan's head. Um so on the one hand, Andrew is saying that the property tax in of itself is not uh, is not fair and it's not equitable and it stands in our way, which is just true. Like that's just a true statement. It's a regressive tax. Um, it's based off of a time when the amount of land you own directly related to how much money you make. There was a one. There was there was a cor like a, a straight up correlation that was reliable. We don't live in that time anymore. Not everybody is a farmer. Um, the world changed. Sorry. So, uh, in that sense, uh, from that perspective, Valinsky is absolutely right. The the property tax is horrible. And what he then goes on to explain is that there's a new new data that has come out that has been you know. Um, It essentially, and I'll, I will, I will see if I can get it pulled up here while I'm talking about it. But um, in many ways, it like <sighs> okay, so. What this new data set is, we like essentially we can do what we've we we can we can cover what we need to cover with the with money we raise, right? Which is okay. Um, it's possible to do it. What it requires is it requires a certain redistribution, um, effective redistribution of the burden itself. Right. So the idea is that, um, you know, each town makes up a certain percentage of um, of its education budget, depending on how much revenue they raise off of their taxes. It kicks in and it is compensated by the state when the town is more poor, right? It's that it's, it's possible to do it if there's, there's a certain amount of kick up or there's, there's a, there is a way feasibly, uh, at least according to this data to do that. And Valinsky is citing that and basically citing, yeah, look, it's it, like, if you rejigger it a bit the way, you know, what we have, um, it's entirely possible to, make this work um and so i just he, in this instance that's not an argument necessarily for a property tax but just simply an argument that there's steps of gradation within this this broader discussion and not taking the pledge just doesn't put a cap on it. You know what I mean? At the same time, it's, it's, he's still offering a way to work within the felt, the, the framework that Feltus is kind of insisting upon, but it, it but then gets criticized for it. So I'm going to just going to hop back to this clip. We're going to watch this some more. And, uh, Senator Feltus, uh, you've said you would close tax loopholes uh, to try to relieve the property tax burden. Can you ex go into detail about that? How you, how, which ones you would close, and how much that would raise to relieve property taxes? Sure. Thank you, John. Uh, in New Hampshire, roughly 50% of businesses and corporations that are based in New Hampshire or sell into New Hampshire a product or service pay even a cent in our corporate tax code. 
and the last budget securing over 200 million in new support for our communities, including securing 140 million in new public school education funding, the biggest public school education budget in state history, finally doing full day kindergarten, the biggest increase in 20 years. We closed loopholes for corporations in the system, including corporations like Netflix, who clearly had a business relationship with the state of New Hampshire selling a product or service into the state of New Hampshire. There are a lot more of those loopholes to close. Uh, and I don't support a broad-based income tax. Uh, last night at a, at a forum, uh, Andrew said he would sign a budget with a broad-based income tax in it. And I disagree with Andrew. I don't think we spend the right amount on schools. I think the state should step up and spend more on our schools. I think the question was, how much in the loopholes would you develop? I think the, uh, well, Andrew, a lot more than your <laughs> shuffling around property taxes. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh no oh gosh hold on i'm i gotta pull that back and watch it again a little bit because that was just like so priceless man Oh, no. Okay. Hold on. We're going to we're going to pull it back. We're going to do like go back maybe 30 seconds. Just I got to I got to get this again. Uh, and I don't support a broad based income tax. Uh, last night at a, at a forum, uh, Andrew said he would sign a budget with a broad based income tax in it. And I disagree with Andrew. I don't think we spend the right amount on schools. I think the state should step up and spend more on our schools. I think the question was, how much in the loopholes would you develop? So, like, okay. It, this is hilarious because Dan just never answers the question. Literally, just never answers his question. And instead decides to try and attack Andrew for saying that, um for saying that it's enough, right? Now, what Andrew said is that this study says that there is enough to, it, he said it's about, they say that it's about right, okay? Not the same thing as Andrew saying it's about right. Andrew might want more funding. He probably does. I'm sure he does, okay? <laughs> I'm really sorry. This is good stuff. So, um, so there's, there's a weird, like, tie being made that's just simply not true that Dan's trying to do while simultaneously he's not answering his own question. So again, bad debate tactics, right? You're starting to get into dodging and trying to use a false equivalency logical fallacy to destroy your opponent's position when effectively you're just opening yourself up to more attacks. So we'll, we'll get to, to Valinsky's sort of like what now moment right here. I think the, uh, well, Andrew, <laughs> a lot more than your shuffling around property taxes. Actually, and, uh, it's, it deals with the problem as the experts indicated the last week. So how much will you develop for the budget for schools with closing your loopholes? And why haven't you closed them till now? Okay, so really quick, this is the, this right here is the piece that they're talking about, right? This is the information. Um, it's pretty detailed, and I'm not necessarily going to take the time to explain the whole thing on today's stream but i will make sure that there's a link in the description so the folks can read this because this is this is important okay this is very important um so basically i say it it consists of two components 
a mandatory minimum minimum contribution would be required of every municipality in the form of local property tax. Local contribution would be supplemented by statewide property tax, the proceeds of which would be distributed among school districts using the weighted formula. Um, so... Let's see here. Um, yeah, so uh, I do believe they give. Yeah, okay. So I'll get down to the uh, the example here. So um, in Claremont, funding would total thirty three point nine million, or twenty two thousand twenty two hundred twenty two dollars per student of which the local state shares would be 3.6 million and 30.3 million respectively. <clears throat> Funding in Durham would amount to 12.8 million or 13,737 per student, 6.1 million raised locally, 6.7 million from the state, and in Wolfboro, funding of 9 million 166,439 or 12,892 dollars per student would consist entirely of the local contribution of 11,198,189 dollars. So this is what it's talking about. Like if you're ta when Dan says we're going to raise taxes, what he's talking about is we're going to fairly tax super wealthy towns to pay for their students so that they don't absorb state funding that really desperate towns absolutely need in order to be able to provide an adequate education, which is the fucking language that the state uses. <laughs> Come on. Like, so this is the thing. Feltus is arguing against fairness right here. When you, when you make the, the argument, and he actually had a campaign aide do precisely that, on Twitter, argue against fairness. We're literally going to argue against saying, hey, wealthy people need to pay their fair share. It is not chill for the poorest of us to get taxed off our asses to be funding out through state dollars a wealthy community's school program. The idea should go in reverse. You make the people at the top pay for what they need to pay for. And what's cool about this right here is that essentially the proposal is saying that it's not even about anything more than be responsible for your own yard, right? Like if Wolfboro earns enough to pay for their students, they should they, like they don't they don't need state funding they can cover it that's cool help a town that needs it so anyways i just really to get back to this sort of like nonsense um that's that's really what what you're dealing with in this situation so i just kind of want to give that that caveat and we'll get back to it right now okay we did close them we dedicated over 200 million hey, by the way it's one thing to litigate an funding case it's another thing to deliver ed funding that's what we did we developed the most progressive budget in state history and we got to build off of it andrew your idea is to raise property taxes in some communities and then redistribute it it sounds like that's your idea i think the state should step up and support public school education you know this is about Iris and Josie's future. It's about all our kids' future. They deserve a foundation for success and opportunity that's as strong as the granite under our soil. We're going to build off that progressive budget that Democrats did and move forward. Well, I'll just say that most progressive budget leaves us 50th in the nation in state support for public education. Okay, he's right. Volinsky's very right right there. This is a huge, huge issue that I want like this is this is for the left right for the left this is where you attack the center you attack them on the fact that everything it's it's all historicized to them right like it's all within this historical context of well this is the most progressive budget in state history okay yeah how progressive is that we cannot pretend that we exist in our own historical vacuum. It's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. We in New Hampshire like to pretend that there's no other, like, like nobody else has done anything that's better than what we did. 
when in reality, we're stuck in the 1700s, legislatively speaking. And we use asinine arguments like most progressive budget in history to justify incremental change that doesn't do jack for people that are really, really struggling, that need to actually a fundamental shift in the way in which things are funded for them in their communities so that they're not struggling so hard all the time. And this is just like, you want to talk about politics as usual. This is, this is the politics as usual. And I think that comes up in a minute, but like, it really is just, this is preposterous. Okay. That's, we got to examine the absurdist framing that Democrats put forward. The, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm, I'm so sick of it. I really appreciate that Andrew just calls it out. A lot of people seem to not like I've, I have heard repeatedly that he's made enemies over this. And frankly, you know what? Anybody that's feeling salty about it, I would say that maybe thicken your skin up a little bit. And stop being so so concerned about what people think you. You know what I mean? Like, I'll get canceled for this this show or whatever I say. Like, people people don't even understand it. Like, you put yourself out here and you say something that really matters to folks, and most of the time, it gets twisted around a lot, and that's what's happening right there. And to really take that that hard position requires accepting the fact that people are going to misinterpret you all the time and the most important thing to do is do exactly what Andrew is doing right here this is like in my opinion there's some he's he's leading by example and just not taking it and just not sitting on it and not letting the moderator cut it off or just you know like it's important to push back on this absurd framing because because we got to change the way like, like people's sort of um political vocabulary, I guess. And maybe not necessarily just change the vocabulary, but change the way that people understand what each term means. So so sort of like bolstering the understanding of the vocabulary. So, you know, and we'll get into, I'll play it again, but, um, you know, we get into the concept of politics as usual, and I think we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. It was an improvement, but it's mostly one-time money, and it came after multiple years of cuts. So really, you were giving back money that the school district should have gotten in prior years while you were in the Senate, Dan. That's not true, Andrew. And I know you've never worked on a state budget, but this is the biggest public school budget in state history, the biggest increase in 20 years. And you know what? For for Andrew to say, look, we're 50th after this budget, um, and then say we spend the right amount on schools doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. So right there, there it is. You just watched it happen. Okay. Dan says... That's not true when Andrew points out that funding has repeatedly been cut. So every single time you cut something, right, basically now we are clamoring to get back what we lost. And Dan's like, no, that's not how it works. Well, okay, you're the one who cares about the history of everything, right? Like the, the how, how historically progressive this budget is you you care so much about the history of the politics in the state well where's the consciousness for the history of austerity and loss of tax dollars and if dan seriously like that should concern us about dan as a senator in his mindset right does he seriously not think that he's fighting to get back funding or does he like does he genuinely think he's out here pioneering new funding that's never existed before like what the hell what the hell is that i i I am that baffles me that is so confounding to me 
that he would not accept that frame. Like, to me, that seems like a pretty basic frame understanding for most people on the left, even to the center, that we are in a process of reclaiming funding that we should have had dating back to Claremont, right? Like, this isn't, like, this is absurd. This is absurd that he does that and then turns around and accuses Andrew of not having made a budget before right like like all of a sudden we we what do we disqualify somebody's eligibility to run for governor's office because they weren't elected to the senate or the house first do you have to have that prerequisite credential in order to actually hold the governor's office because it sounds like Dan's kind of trying to just purity test Andrew right here which is in in and it's it's an establishment purity test which is even worse it's like career politician purity testing it's it's gross it's gross and he's still not answering the question about the loopholes still not answering it a lot from Andrew about the pledge this, the pledge that. We don't hear any plans. And let's be clear, talking about the pledge without talking about your plans is just politics as usual. Uh, well, the pledge is politics as usual. I'm happy to explain the problem with school funding, but let's allow the next question. <laughs> and I. All right. So, yeah, I mean, there's. There it is. There's, you know. <laughs> I just, like, I hope we are all watching the same thing right now. Like, if I'm off base, I would love somebody to explain to me how I'm off base. But you know what? This is just, this, that's, 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 that's madness. That is absolute madness, in my opinion. So, I'll try and jump a little more to the end here and see just, you know what what we've got in our 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 uh, final stretch here um i think you know this is this last bit i think is is really um worth doing so i'm going to go for it and before the candidates will make their closing statements. We're living in a time when people are anxious. They're worried about their health, their children, their jobs, the political climate, and a whole lot more. So how are you the person who will help lead Granite Staters through these times? We begin with Senator Feltis on that. Well, thank you, Jennifer. You ought to be able to trust that someone's gonna be in your corner. Working people and working families ought to have someone in their corner in the corner office. That's who I fought for my entire career. When I was fighting for uh, that coverage for folks with diabetes to make sure the price cap is only 30 bucks out of pocket. When I was fighting as a legal aid lawyer for access to health care. Uh, Andrew was representing Craig Benson and Craig Benson's corporation dismissing someone with diabetes. When I was fighting to protect homeowners, including Carl and Paul Heen, who got the home of their dreams, a modest home, and then fell behind during the Great Recession with job loss. When I was representing them and helping them save their home against a Wall Street bank, Andrew was on the other side in the Great Recession, representing a title company that was alleged to defraud people out of their homes. So fundamentally, this is about who you trust. I've always been on the side of working people and working families, and we need to get out of this mess in a Senator? way that works for them, Senator, thank not you. corporate special Senator, interest. thank you. Councilor Valinsky, your response to the final question? Yeah, I, I think we need to rely on people who will tell the truth no matter whether it's helpful or painful for them. Those comments about the title insurance company, the title insurance company was disciplined by the Department of Insurance for giving discounts to fellow business members of the Portsmouth Country Club. It had nothing to do with mortgages. That's just a bald-faced misstatement. Look, you need people who you can trust, who show good judgment on Granite Bridge, 
I opposed the Granite Bridge frac to gas pipeline, and I stayed opposed to it. I haven't switched sides on that issue back and forth, back and forth. On campaign finance, I said I wouldn't take PAC money, and I wouldn't take LLC money, and I've never had to return money because I didn't live up to my own standards as Dan has. It's judgment, it's honesty, it's candor. Counselor? That's can who you trust. Counselor, thank you. You know, look, um, I want to show this segment, you know, I wanted to show this little, little piece because I think it is, you know, it's important to acknowledge, look, like, I don't, you're never going to get a perfect candidate, right? You're never going to get exactly every single thing that you want, okay? And realistically, we can be not necessarily happy about certain aspects of Andrew's work history, but I want to, like, I really want to put this out there to y'all folks for a second, okay? We all have to exist in this capitalist society that makes us do so many horrible things to each other. Because we have to make a paycheck. We have to get our rent covered. We have to keep our lights on. We have to buy food. We have to do all this stuff. And we've commodified everything in our society. That's just what Americans decided to do. It's what we, what we hold up. And <clears throat> every single person has had to... in some capacity participate in some sort of unethical process. That could be as low level as your boss instructed you to not recycle at work. Or it could be working for a private law firm and you are taking clients that you take and you're defending clients that you defend. And if you're not a partner at that law firm, you don't necessarily have full say over what goes on. Now, is there reason to question or interrogate, you know, aspects of this? Yeah, sure. Okay. But this kind of goes back to purity testing, right? And I think it is a really, really, really stupid and slippery slope for us to get on when it comes to litigating work history of people and using that as the sole measure of their contribution when there's other aspects of that person's life that need to be given equal late and uh, and historicized within that own person's life and experiences and inputs. Okay, so look, when it comes to Claremont, it's it's really difficult to say that you know that Andrew Valinsky hasn't been integral in dramatically shaping the conversation around education funding and property taxes in this state, which is probably one of the, if not the most hot button issue next to say like addiction, like the addiction crisis, right? Like this is, this is huge. And this is again, historical, right? Because Claremont is old now. It's really old. You know, that's, we're talking about the nineties. It's like, it's like 30 years ago. And it's like do we which which case, right? Which which case do we inspect? Do we inspect the time that he worked for Craig Benson? A uh, one-term governor who did miserably 
and is kind of a joke to a lot of people. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that still love Craig Benson, I guess, but like, you, you know, it's kind of, um, that was, I was a different, different time in a different situation against a different candidate. And there's a lot to be said for whether or not Fernald was a good candidate in that governor's race. But, um, Attacking Valinsky's bona fides just seems like not, um, like, not a good tactic. Like attacking Valinsky's progressive bona fides just doesn't seem like a good call. Um, you know, casual reminder that this coming, uh, this coming Monday on Labor Day, which, you know, I really like Volinsky is meeting on with you know this is a special event that rad is hosting with bernie sanders the labor candidate who has endorsed andrew Volinsky. now i know that bernie sanders probably doesn't carry as much weight for a lot of people these days i get it i totally get it um But the fact of the matter is Sanders um, Sanders is still a really important part of this discussion. And he represents a very specific subset of the sort of democratic socialist view of reformation within the Democratic Party through revolutionary means, which I think is an interesting approach. Um, obviously, it's uh, somewhat problematic. But, you know, like it's it, it's definitely important to consider that even despite um despite Sanders' loss, right, which is a huge drag. No joke. Very very not not pleased about it, but It's really worth noting that Volinsky outraised Feltis last quarter. Um, more grassroots volunteers. He's not taking any PAC money. You know, I had my own certain skepticisms about whether or not Volinsky would be able to, to really take the nomination this time around. And I got to say... Looking at, at at that data, right? I don't like that. Just just those those hard numbers. I mean, I'm not necessarily looking at polling. I'm looking at just like if I'm, you know, from a resources and pure positioning standpoint, based off of the contents of that um, <laughs> debate, Andrew's looking a lot stronger. So, um, progressive folks. Rally behind this. Tuesday is coming. It is coming. It is less than a week away now. Uh, so, just, you know, I don't know, food for thought. I definitely, I definitely want to hear from folks on this, this whole take. So, hop into the comments on this video. Let me know what you think down there. Reply to it on Twitter, comment on Facebook, do, you know, like the whole kit and caboodle because you know, I'm going to use all these dumb Yankee catchphrases. Um, seriously, though, I, I actually want to, you know, I talked about the vulnerability of being out here and doing progressive content. And I guess, you know, it's like the, here's the sort of plug segment of the show because we're wrapping it up now. Um I think doing this can be challenging, right? Because 
on the one hand, I have my opinions and I want to be able to be, come out here and I want to be able to talk about like, hey, what's wrong with capitalism? Let's have a meaningful conversation about what socialism is compared to, you know, communism compared to this or that. Let's have these ideological conversations because I, I just I genuinely think it's 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 really not smart to not consider all components at all times right just the same way i sit here and i'll say we need to look at what the you know the ultra right does and we need to look at their tactics and their that whole thing and i know that i'll be critical of people here too but i also want to be open and honest about the fact that despite whatever disagreements i may have with folks i want people to feel welcome to come into this space i want people to feel welcome to challenge me i want this to actually be a um I want this to be a more interactive type of media for folks in the sense that I like y'all should feel comfortable hitting me up. Um, if you want to come on this show, if you if, if you feel like you've got something to say and you want to have a discussion with me, and you want to talk about an issue. I'm actually like this isn't a one way street, folks. Like you can hit me up and you can see if you want to come on and, and discuss an issue and like we'll hash it out first. I'll talk to you ahead of time. We'll figure it out. But um I really I want this to not just be a, a members only club. I'll you know, I'm certainly I, I love the idea of having regular guests and we've definitely already managed to develop sort of a, you know, friends of the show group uh we've had a number of people come back on a couple times so that's always a good thing and i want to keep that up you know i like the idea of building this community and the other thing is i want folks to feel comfortable reaching out to the other people that are on this show that um this isn't some weird attempt at cultivating celebrity right like what this is is actually a way to have people see our faces to familiarize themselves with what we're saying what we're thinking what we're doing uh how we talk about stuff how we go about doing things and then actually being able to push the discussion and the strategy and the tactics forward so that working class people um black indigenous and people of color in this state uh, LGBTQ, disabled, everybody can feel included, can feel like they have a voice, can feel heard, can feel valued. That's the goal, right? That's that's the real target of the the locally sourced live stream. And even the the local stream to that extent too, and that's that's also a big part of what the the target is with deep dive. And I know that Jonah and I haven't done an episode in a couple of weeks, but we will. We that trust me, that's not something that's just going to get forgotten about. And I've I've been talking to other people about trying to get other content going too. And I think that stuff is really important. I think it's it's good for us to expand this and to 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 widen widen the horizons as much as possible see how far we can take this and not be afraid to have challenging conversations you know like to be able to let people come on and in person give the hot take that they would give on twitter or facebook or whatever like if you've got the courage to say it in that space have the courage to come here and say it in this space and let's do it in that real meaningful way I know that right now with coronavirus, everything is killing us and it's so hard because we can't just be with each other. We can't just really be in person. So we got to do these dumb video calls, right? And and I want so badly, I talk about this all the time, how I just want so badly to get back to a point where, you know, I'm, we're in the studio and we're doing real in-person interviews. I think that's a, a huge target. That's absolutely somewhere that I want to see this program be at long term. I think we can do a lot more fun stuff. But until then, you know, set up goals, right? We've got some goals for the channel. I want to, I'm, we are five subscribers as of as of this broadcast, we are five subscribers away from 100. That's going to allow us to get on YouTube. That's going to allow us to get that that sweet, sweet, unique URL. We'll be able to plug things a lot more. So really want to get that up, okay? Um, definitely tell your friends you can you can subscribe with just a Gmail account, okay? You don't need to have a special YouTube account. You can just do it with your Gmail. And when you do subscribe, you'll get 
email, you know, if you hit the little bell, you'll get notifications directly pushed to your devices, which is really cool. But you also just get notified of when we when the channel uploads a new live stream or when something happens, right? It's difficult to make everything go and work uh, 100% of the time when it's just me out here doing all this stuff. It's been a challenge to clip things. Uh, so that's something that I hope to see increase in the near future. But it requires meeting certain goals, right? The Patreon. Managed to get up to 23 subscribers on the Patreon. We've got 23 patrons, which is great. Okay, really happy to see that number increasing. Want to get that to 100 patrons um, sooner than later. So definitely tell your friends. Uh, you can support this channel for 2 to $5 a month. As, as little as 2 to $5 a month, you can support this channel and you can help keep this program going and you can help get to a point where we can do better stuff i can get better you know better programming laid out i'll have more time that i can devote to scheduling interviews and doing stuff like that so this is really really important the folks head over to the patreon check it out right there patreon.com slash locally sourced again bottom corner over here hit the subscribe button all bell for notifications follow on twitter right here like us on Facebook. All this stuff is down in the description below. So I really encourage folks, please help make this grow. Let's really try and bulldoze, really push out some space for left media in New Hampshire. We've got Granite Rock. We've got New Hampshire Journal. These guys are just constantly pushing overt conservative narratives out into the public sphere. Okay, You've got WMUR, corporate controlled, NHPR has to maintain an objectivity perspective, which if you've looked, if, if anybody's looked into some of the conversations that we've had on this channel about objectivity, there's absolutely certain fraught aspects of, of that or certain things that get left out of that discussion because of this sort of... Um, over strengthened need for objectivity, which I, I absolutely support data and research and that type of um, that type of thing. We need that. It's it's it is crucial. You got to support local journalism, but at the same time, local commentary that tries to express alternative perspectives on what's happening in New Hampshire politics and beyond is so imperative to our communal understanding. So support the channel. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. I know this pitch segment was really long. I've been trying to do them at the end of the segments because I just, I don't want to front load it, you know? So uh, now that all of the viewership has dropped off like a rock while I'm talking about this stuff, um, thanks so much for coming, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. I'll try and get some clips up of this stuff. And uh, take care, and I'll uh, try and... Be back for y'all folks tomorrow. It's going to be a good one making it happen. So take care and enjoy.